Good morning, church. My name is Chad. Today I have the joy of uh, preaching for you all. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. We'll be in verses 27 through 45. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 45. If you don't have a Bible, there's a hardback black Bible in the pew in front of you. That's our gift to you. Uh, we'll be on page 862 of those Bibles. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 45. But I say to you, uh, but, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer also the other. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you love those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom, from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, will be used, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck, uh, uh, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite! You take out, uh, you take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for your fairness. Thank you that you make known to us the path of life. As we search your word today, lead us uh, in our minds, in our hearts, as we read, as I speak. Lord, we trust that as we search your word, your Holy Spirit is at work in us, conforming us to the image of your Son. May it be to your glory and our joy. Amen. So, we're in Luke chapter 6 this morning. A few years ago, uh, PJ took you all through Luke. Uh, but just in case, allow me to, to give you a little refresher. Uh, Luke is not an eyewitness. He's a Gentile physician, uh, a companion of Paul, who is commissioned by Theophilus uh, to compile an orderly account of the gospel, that he might have certainty about the things that he's heard. So, he's He's compiling and comp uh, comparing stories uh, from all over. He's writing this all down, studying it closely. Uh, he's writing because he wants Theophilus to be certain about what actually happened. The uh, and so leading up to chapter 6, Luke is 
uh, sharing about the care that he's taking uh, to record this account. He's uh, speaking with great specificity about the birth of this Messiah. He's sharing about uh, Jesus' uh, preparation for ministry with uh, John the Baptist and being baptized and his temptation in the wilderness. And from the middle of chapter 4 onwards, uh, Jesus is on mission, doing the work of ministry, uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, and now in the, in the immediate context of chapter 6, Jesus is sharing uh, some blessings and curses, uh, literally blessings and woes, uh, as he talks about the Beatitudes. Now the promise of, of uh, the, the surrounding context is uh, that, that God's way is better. The, the difficulty uh, is, is that being full and rich and will, really well thought of is a really attractive thing. And that brings us to our passage today. Verses 27 through 29, Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer also the other. Now, as we see it in Scripture, other, other Christians are primarily not our enemies. Uh, it doesn't mean that we agree with everything every other Christian does, uh, but they're not our primary enemies. A few years ago, um, I, was, uh, I was getting to know someone. Um, he asked to borrow a tool of mine. Um, and now I, now I only knew this, uh, I, I only knew this guy for a few weeks, uh, so it was a real kind of testing of our relationship. I, I let him borrow uh, one tool of a complete set. And I'm, I'm no handyman. I, I, can, I can hang a picture or maybe with some help and store a do doorknob. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, as a guy, I think there, there might just be something in our DNA that this is just a common experience for us. Uh, we lend out a tool, part of a set, um, our friend loses it, and we're absolutely irked. It drives us nuts. Uh, for some of us, it's, it's our children touching the, the, the thermostat. Um, for others, it's someone leaving a sink full of dirty dishes. For others, it's the things your coworkers do. And others, maybe it's the political reality of, of, the, of the school system. These things from time to time have an effect on our hearts. If God just cared about how we treated people, his command would not have been love. But how we feel inevitably overflows into action. So Jesus is clear, we must love. The difficulty is that none of us are actually capable of changing our hearts. Who here has a dog? Raise your hand. Okay, now keep your hand raised if you love your dog. Okay, now keep your hand raised if you think by your own sheer will you could stop loving your dog at the snap of my finger. Put it down if you think you can, if, if, if you think you can control that. <laughs> okay, so for everyone who, who put their hands down who said, uh, I, I, I think that I, my emotions are not commanded so much by Chad or, or by myself, uh, but it's a result of my experience and this love that's within me. Uh, you guys, I, I think you guys had it right. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Chalmers, uh, an old 1800s uh, free church minister, wrote in a sermon once titled, uh, The Expulsive uh, Power of a New Affection. Uh, taking note of our sinful nature, he writes about our ability to manage our affections. He says, the whole heart and habit will rise in resistance to this undertaking. Earlier, he says, to try to manage our affections is incompetent and ineffectual. <laughs> Romans 3.12 says the same thing. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. No, not one. Because we aren't God, we aren't actually capable of changing our hearts. So if we can't change our hearts, how do we, how do we love those that just bug us? We'll come back to this question. For now, let's keep reading. Verses 30 through 36. Give to everyone who begs from you. 
And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. Do good and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. So what we see here is, is frankly, an impossible standard, especially this last verse, verse 36. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. That sounds beautiful until someone cuts you off on the freeway. Or... Consider verse 30, give to everyone. We have a lot of needs in our area, even just within this room. I think Jesus means for us to rightly feel two needs. He's made us in his image. Other men and women, enemies as they may be, are his creation. He cares for them, and if God cares for them, so should we. If we see someone in need and we harden our hearts, God has a problem with it. He, his glory is evident in them. Failing to treasure that person is actually failing to treasure God. Think about the way that he speaks about loving and caring for us. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 6, 25 through 30. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus cares about our daily needs. He, simply because we're made in his image. He loves us, he loves us, he loves us. The first need is the, the need to, to love like Jesus. He has made all men and all women in his image. So even with non-Christians, even with our enemies, the people that bug us, God has called us to love. It's actually a matter of worship because God has made them in his image. When you love others, you're treasuring God because that's his handiwork. And in due time, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, we will receive our reward. Man, if, if there is not a better deal than this, love is this filling, joyous emotion. The greatest commandment is to experience that emotion. And God actually says that when we experience this positive emotion, he's going to reward us. It's like someone offered you a free dinner at Crow's Nest and then promised that if you enjoyed the food, he, that person would have Gordon Ramsay personally serve you five-star, ten-course meals for the rest of your life. If loving God by loving others is, is not the best, I don't know what is. The second need is, as beautiful as, as that sounds, we are simply incapable of producing that level of love. It's, it's actually too great. We can try, and people do. They're, they're nonprofits we, who, who serve the homeless, who uh, help uh, give people food, provide housing. 
Um, we can give the guy in the corner a few bucks, and we might even invite someone into our houses. We might share good doctrine with others, preach God's word, tell them everything that we think they might need to know, and we can, we can do everything we think we possibly can, but at the end of the day, it's insufficient. It doesn't rise to God's glory. Try as we may, God's love is greater, and he's the standard. So what do we do with this standard? Let's keep reading. Verse 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. No one likes to be judged. You, you don't have to be a Christian to know this verse. Even non-Christians know we're not supposed to judge. Uh, but as PJ said last week, there, there is a place to speak denials. Last December, um, the, the elders asked me to fill out a, a questionnaire for, for my annual review. And I was, as I was thinking and praying about this review, it was important for me to get some critical feedback. As I was reflecting who would be able to provide the, the most accurate, helpful, direct feedback, I found that list of people to include those who are closest to me. These people have access to every area of my life. It was important to me, and I think it's important to all of us, that we have others in our lives who can make biblical assessments about the ways that we're living. And I think the same is true when we're sharing our assessments with others. Uh, if, if I met someone at Starbucks, and he or she expresses to me something that indicated they might not be a Christian, my response doesn't typically uh, entail uh, an immediate, immoralistic rebuke. I'm going to ask that person about what they treasure, why they think it satisfies, and in those questions, I'm going to do my best within the role that God has given me to help that person see and understand that Jesus is greater. Fully trusting that as that person comes to discover that joy, the peace, the freedom of Jesus in their life, he will have a transformative effect on their lives and their pursuits. On some level, people know that their ways are wicked and, and that they need to repent. On the other hand, it's also possible to give people more than they're ready for. We dare not shrink back. But if I could put a spin on a quote from Piper, uh, John Piper, affections for Jesus are the engine, the front of the train, what makes it run. Affections are the means of its function, the beginning and the main thing in Christian living. Likewise, a person unchanged by God is like a train with no cargo. It serves no purpose. Our conversations with others should reflect this priority, whether it be someone at work, at school, or even at home. Listen to me because I said so is a good way to get attention. It's not greatly effective for creating long-lasting change. I think this is why in 1 Peter 5, this is why elders are exhorted to, to lead willingly. It wouldn't be uh, enough for me to just uh, tell you uh, to love just because. I have to show you why. If we look at the biblical theme of Scripture, the way that Jesus does ministry, the, the way that the apostles write, it seems to me that the cause of our Christian living is more important, more effective, and more, longer, uh, more lasting than compulsion. Jesus wants our hearts because the heart is the only lasting path to transformation. All right, let's recap where, where we've been so far. God has called us to love even our enemies. Number two, God has called us to love in action. Number three, God has called us to love in our communication. Number four, God calls us to love by forgiving others. And I have a fifth that's coming. Sometimes we hear uh, God's great design for the world, and because it's just beyond what we can imagine, we're, we're tempted to lower the standards. 
I think Jesus knows that in our hearts we might say, yeah, that sounds good, and I know the Bible's true, but uh, it's, it's not my experience. Maybe he means something less. Jesus answers this sort of thinking in the next verse, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. With the, uh, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus doesn't settle. His plan for created order is otherworldly. God has designed us to love others in good measure, pressed down, packed in, running over. So when we, when, when we don't get precisely what we want, when others mess up, when we think someone might be living in sin, our response is important. R.C. Sprawl gives a helpful sermon on this topic. What we assume about others matters. Jumping to accusations or uh, making assumptions is, is not love pressed down in good measure running over. Christians are Christ-like, Christ followers. We want to look like him. The wound of a friend is trustworthy, Proverbs 27.6. They're well prayed over, well purposed, born of a personal love and compassion. It's building up. The friend is quick to listen, slow to speak, asks questions, assumes the best, gives the benefit of the doubt in good measure, packed down, pouring over with grace. So if you wrote down our, our recap earlier, the fifth item is God calls us to love in good measure. Christians live in this love, and we live, live out of this love. Thank God it doesn't depend on us. Verses 39 through 42. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that is, out, that is in your eye, when you yourself have a log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Tough love can be a good thing. Uh, it's, it's best used selflessly, unassuming, and infrequently. It can also be a cop-out for something more selfish. Jesus says, those who live by the, by the sword will die by the sword. The same is true in conversation. Uh, James 3, 7 through 8 says, For every kind of beast or bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Here's the big idea of verses 39 through 42. We're not very good at doing Jesus' job. He doesn't like it when we try. Trust him to do the heavy lifting. Those splinters we see in other people's eyes are probably actually logs. We can't even see the whole picture. And most of us have some pretty threatening diseases ourselves. So what are we doing? blind surgeons on ventilators trying to fix others. Verse 40, he's the shepherd, we're the sheep. When sheep try to do their master's job, they end up in trouble. Verse 39, we're blind beggars. Because we have Jesus, we have someone to lead us. Our job as Christians is not prescribing the world a whole new moral law. What we do here on Sundays is not moral therapeutic behavior modification. 
Jesus says, I have food that you do not know about. Come taste and see. As people who were lost and now are found, the most loving thing that we can do is share the joy of him with others. To tell others of the only one, the only man who can truly seize, the only one who satisfies forever. He is the sight. He is the food. He is everything that we need. We can be good theologians. We, we can have good morals. We can make right decisions and ensure others do the same. All good things. But there's a higher calling. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, blessed, happy, privileged, is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 34, 8. Same as love, it's a biblical command. Best deal in the world. He gets the glory, we get the joy, over and over and over. That's the objective. Love God. Simple as that. Part of loving God is actually loving others. Now, in the last year being with you guys, I've, I've preached nine sermons with you. You might notice that every passage I preach on is connected to this theme of joy. I don't think there's one word in all of scripture that God does not intend to use for our joy. Not everyone buys it, but hear me say it's not a new message. In uh, 1648, the churches of Scotland, England, and Ireland all got together in one great assembly. 121 Puritan pastors, uh, not uneducated, uh, their work proves intellectually gifted. They drafted a document in which they try to surmise some truths of the gospel. The first question they asked was, what is the chief end of man? Their answer, man's chief end, our, our ultimate purpose, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Not chief ends, chief end, singular, not plural. We have one ultimate purpose. After 121 well-gifted pastors got together, they said, glorifying God is enjoying him. And that's our ultimate purpose. Matthew 5.20, anything else isn't enough. Now, we are reformers, always reforming, standing on the shoulders of giants, being led by God's word to build upon the solid foundation of our teachers. If I was at that conference, I would say, yes, absolutely. And as a church, our ultimate purpose is to enjoy him together. We have one greatest commandment, love God and love others. It's one commandment, not two. And here's the thing, because we cheapen this word, it's lost a lot of meaning throughout the years. I love trail mix. What I mean by that <laughs> ought to be a bit different than my love of others. This is nothing new. John says it's, it's actually the beginning. It's not step two. When you first become a Christian, this is what happens. 1 John 3.11, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is from the beginning. It's a biblical command, Philippians 4.4. 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Joy is an imperative command. But for some of us, here's the problem. Our cup doesn't always feel that full. It doesn't always feel running over. Luke 6, 38. For some here, it doesn't even feel half full. Got it. I sympathize. I've been there. What we've got to be careful of is that we're not imposing our feelings and our ideas on the text, but rather looking to draw out the author's intent and seeking to be conformed to the image of Jesus presented there. How do we get to this point where our love for Jesus looks like this, in, in good measure, press down, shaken together, running over 
such that it overflows into our relationships with others to the point where we can love our enemies. There's a density and potency to this love. When our hearts are pricked, what spills out is evidence of what dwells within us. How do we get to the point where our love for those who just bug the heck out of us just flows constantly, over and over, regardless of time, season, or circumstance? It's easy to love our neighbor when everything is going well. When everything is going our way and we're just happy and comfortable, verses 32 through 34, even non-believers do that. When someone presses just the right button, how do we get our heart to the point of not just bearing with that person, but, but true love? If I could put my own spin on the quote of another pastor, it's possible, frighteningly possible, I've discovered, to externally obey the one another's with a mind and heart utterly at odds with Christ and with a smile that hides bitterness and a false compassion to masquerade pride. What is the heartfelt, spilling over, abundant emotion of true love? True love serves. It's kind. It's patient. Not jealous. It's slow to speak. It's tender-hearted and rejoices in good things. It hopes and endures is humble and abides, trusting in God's plan for yourself and for others. How do we get our love to look like that? Verses 30, uh, 43 through 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Now, I promise, whether uh, we realize it all or not, all of us, on our own ability, cannot love, cannot forgive, uh, we will judge, we will uh, bear awful, sour, sour fruit on our own ability. Sometimes it's easier to think that our sin isn't that bad. Romans 118 through 320, the letter to the Galatians, the whole canon of scripture tells one story. Our sin is way more a problem than we think it is. Even us who have new life, our Christians being shaped and molded into the image of God, we still struggle. It's an ongoing process of transformation. And sometimes it's really little, little by little every day, and you're just inching along. This passage does not mean that Christians are perfect and everyone else isn't. Verses 43 through 45 are a reflection of my first sermon for y'all, Psalm 1. If you've heard nothing today, hear this. It's the reason for the whole passage and everything leading up to it. Here it is. Our ability to love like Jesus comes from Jesus. Our ability to love like Jesus comes from Jesus. If we are the tree and we want to honor God in bearing good fruit, do one thing. See and know and treasure. Drink deeply of his grace. He is the stream. I didn't say do more. That's, that's fruit. But rather take advantage of his gifts. Uh, God calls us to be childlike. Uh, Matthew 18, 3 through 4. When I was a child, uh, my parents gave me good gifts. One of those gifts was an annual pass to, to Disneyland uh, for me and my siblings. 
And I remember uh, waking my parents up uh, at daybreak, uh, begging them to take me. And I remember going to Disneyland, going on ride after ride after ride, asking for one after another after another. And we would stay all day sometimes from 8 a.m. Uh, till fireworks at 9.15 p.m., sometimes 12 or 13 hour, hours a day, just enjoying these good gifts. My parents must have been so tired. But I'm so thankful for their joyful willingness. God never grows tired of giving you good gifts. He has no budgets. He doesn't grow impatient. He desires simply that you would pursue him more. He says this over and over. James 4, 2, you do not have because you do not ask. John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Matthew 7, 8, everyone who asks, receives. If you want to be more filled with love, just pouring over for God, unceasing for your enemy, a legacy for your family, then take advantage of God's goodness. Like my younger self at Disneyland, Ask him over and over and over. James 1.17, he's a good father who delights in giving good gifts. And he's really good at it. Ask him, Lord, where do I have room to see you as even more wonderful? If we drink deeply of God's grace, it will inevitably overflow into better doctrine, more prayer, and transforming relationships and, and real application. It starts here, though. He's the living water. He fills our roots, strengthens the tree, makes it abound with good, sweet, precious, attractive fruit for all of us to enjoy. God, let us never mistake the fruit for the stream. Before we pray, let me give you the big idea of Luke 6, 27 through 45 and some takeaways for this week. Here's the big idea. We need love. Others need love. God is love. Enjoying him, uh, enjoy him and you, will abound, and you will love in abundance. Let me repeat that. We need love. Others need love. God is love. Enjoy him, and you will love in abundance. All right, here are three takeaways for this week. One, spend some time fasting. Fasting sometimes get a, get a rap is, is something like self-punishment. That's not what it is. One of the great utilities of fasting is it helps us identify our competing joys. What are the things that compete for your relationship with God? Spend some time this week working through that with your father and his word and prayer with his people. It's not punishing. It's actually quite rewarding. When done for the right reasons, it doesn't make us cranky. It actually helps us identify why we might be cranky. <laughs> it's putting down one good thing uh, for something even better. Namely, the pursuit of a more joy-filled relationship with God. And when you find more joy in Jesus, that joy overflows in your relationships with those, with others around you. Number two, uh, initiate a, a first step in building a relationship with another believer outside your household. If you want to love another man or woman in Bible study better, spend some time with them outside of FBC, beyond these walls. Just build a friendship. God has given us friendships for a reason. Ultimately, they glorify him. Simple as it sounds, invite a, a friend to go bowling. Uh, invite one of the ladies over for baking. Uh, take a stroll down East Cliff Drive. This quality time is a means of love and a matter of worship. As simple as it, it sounds simple, but I promise you guys it pays dividends. Number three, as family, you, your spouse, and your kids, pick a passage to read through one of these days after dinner. Uh, look for some ways that God shows his love for us. 
Sharing God's love with one another out of the abundance of our hearts is one of the best types of loves. Let's pray. Lord, thanks that you are love. Thanks for your example of that love in your life and ministry here. Thanks that you are the stream, that you are the living water that we can depend on and that we can depend on you to be the source of our love this week. Help us to trust you more fully to, to be the transforming power of our love. May it be to your glory and our joy. Amen.